And just, again, just double check your cell phones just in case in the middle of the message someone just has the new, newest, newest, and it's like a loud fireworks when you're in the rings or something, you know? Um, but let's go to Psalm 139. Let me tell you about Psalm 139. Usually, if you just grab a Bible and just open it, the Psalms, right, are the largest book in the Bible. How many books are in this Bible? 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Psalms is right in the middle, and there's 150 of them, right? The majority of them were written by who? King David, a man who loved God, a man who failed God, right? This man committed adultery. This man committed murder. This man tried to cover up all of his dirt. He got exposed, let God just heal his heart. He was the perfect description of the best of men. Even the best of men are still just men at best. But because he just loved God, he was teachable. That's all God wants from us, is to be teachable and to just walk in the light with him. Whatever our struggle is, we just walk in the light. We, just, we talk to God about it. David is the gold standard in the Bible, but not because he was a perfect man, but because he was a man that God could get a hold of his heart. Even if he were stubborn, God could always eventually get a hold of his heart and he come back to accepting whatever God's will was for his life, right? He really wanted to love God. He wanted to know God. So it's amazing that you look at his life, it was ups and downs. I mean, if you follow David's life, right, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, doesn't it look like this? Doesn't it look like a straight roller coaster, right? We saw him go through depression, right? Um, we saw him get so depressed that he went and lived with demon worshipers, right? When he was just so run down, when he woke up every day to just life being just so unchangeably hard that he just basically gave up, even though God told him, I'm going to bless you and make you a king, he just basically said, I'm going to die, and I'm just going to go live with the Philistines. I'm going to go live with the devil worshipers. We see him do a lot. We see him defeat Goliath. We see him as a giant slayer. We see him taking a stand for God when no one took a stand for God. So again, right, we see one of his children die. So when you look at his life, it literally looks like this. So isn't it fitting that God would choose him to be the one to write these Psalms? The Psalms are like prayers, if any of you want to learn how to talk to God, read the Psalms. Because imagine if it, they were written, it's 150 of them, 150 Psalms. Imagine if it was written by someone where everyday life was just kind of the same. It'd be like listening to the same song just over and over and over, which if it's a good song, that's cool, but you wouldn't get much from it after a while. His life was literally like this. And he wrote a Psalm, a song everywhere along the way. It teaches us one thing, no matter what you're going through, always talk to God. You see him being honest. What about when he writes and says, I wish I was a bird so I could just fly away from everyone and then I would have some peace of mind. Have any of you ever felt that way? I mean, he literally is encapsulating the whole human experience. That's why people can read this from all over the world, from every culture and relate, right? And you also learn how to just be honest with God with whatever you're going through. I would encourage you, even though we're going through the Bible, just pick the Psalms and just start working through the Psalms. I'll tell you some great Psalms real quick. You want to just write them down? Some, some of my favorite Psalms. All right, you ready? Psalm 103. Psalm 103 is the one that says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how much he removes our dirt and our nastiness from us. When he forgives us, he, he not only just forgives, he cancels the debt like it never happened you see, I can only go north for a little while, then I'm going south. I can only go south for a little while, then I'm at the Antarctica, I'm going north. I can go east forever. I can go west forever. He put an infinite distance between us and our wrongdoings when he forgives us. Psalm 103 really gets into that. Psalm 61, Psalm 62, and Psalm 63. That talks so much about God's power. Psalm 61 is the one that says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's bigger than myself. When I just can't do it, would you just lead me to lean on the Lord, right? Um, Psalms 116. Um, what's some other ones? Psalm 16, right? In the presence of the Lord, there is joy and there are pleasures at his right hand. I have set the Lord before me. It talks about just 
intentionally. And that's what we're trying to do with the daily Bible reading. It says, I'm really making an effort to set God in front of me so I see God before I see the rest of my day and before I see my problems. So as you just go through, you're going to fall in love with the Psalms, and then you'll know whatever you're feeling, you'll know which ones to look at. You'll say, you know what? I need to just be reminded that he's got me. I want Psalm 103. Psalm 139, can I tell you what this Psalm is? This is, this is like the psychiatry Psalm, right? How many of you at some part of your life said, do I need therapy? How many of you said, do I need therapy? I think I need therapy. And there's some right now that are, you know, in a form of therapy. I mean, all of us are in the school of life and, and with our Bible and who are in the church community. Every time we come to church, it is therapy. It is therapy. But it's just like, you know, I just need to just get centered, right? This is what Psalm 139 does. Psalm 139 is that, you ever feel like no one understands you? I mean, you ever feel like, I mean, no one understands you, Right? You ever feel like you just don't fit in? I mean, you can't even create like avatars online. You don't even fit in in like, you know, a video game. You know what I mean? You just feel like no matter where you go, you just don't fit in. You know, you can play basketball, but you don't fit in when you go to the gym. But you're the best one on the court, but you don't fit in. You understand? You ever just feel like you don't fit in? You ever just feel like, you know, no one understands you? You ever feel like you don't understand yourself? You ever just feel like, who am I? You ever just wake up and look at that face in the mirror like, who is you? <laughs> who is you? Like, <laughs> let's just back all the way up. All the, you know, you know, we all have like the school photos that shows how you've grown all those years. And then it's just like as if those photos is a whole different person. Who are you? Who am I? Right? Psalm 139. And this is where if any of you just don't know what to read in your Bible, if any of you just feel like I'm in a funk and what do I even do about it? The first place you should always go is Psalm 139. I feel like Psalm 139 is really just that magnification of the heart of God and the love of God. Because if you think about it, what is really a source of a lot of our problems? A source of a lot of our problems is forgetting who God is really forgetting how awesome he is. A source of a lot of our problems comes from really putting him in a box. And then you get to the Bible and read and you realize, well, I've put him in a box once again. So let's read this psalm. The psalm really, really drives home this point. God made me. God loves me. God understands me. And God has a perfect plan for my life. God made me, God loves me, God understands me, and God has a perfect plan for my life. Because here's what starts to happen. Life comes along and catches you off guard. And because you're so caught off guard, you assume that, oh, everyone must be caught off guard too, including God. Life comes along and you see some stuff about yourself that's new, or you see some stuff about yourself that is just way worse than you thought, or whatever it is. You come to Psalm 139 to realize that it might be new news to you, but it's not new news to him. And what's so mind-blowing is that the one who knows us from the inside out can still love us. Because usually if we were to make a math formula, it would be, well, why do you think we're so scared to let people know the real us? Why do you think it takes eons for people to let their guard down and let people know who they really are? Why do, why do we keep the walls up? Because there is the fear that to truly know everything about me will make you not want to love me, right? To truly know everything about me will make you want to, right? You never had that experience in life? Like, you know, I don't know, you have a heart-to-heart -heart with someone, and you're like, yeah, you know, and then, like, you call them back the next day, and it's like, the number you have called has been changed, and you're like, yo, what? I, I gave, that's why, oh, that's what happens, right? That's what happens when you share your heart. You done scared a person away, so why are we so reluctant to want to share? Because we have the fear that if you really knew me, what happens when someone compliments you? You're like, no, <laughs> if you only really knew me, okay, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't compliment me too much because if you really knew me. But Psalm 139 comes and makes plain this. There is one who knows everything about you, everything, your worst thoughts, your darkest thoughts, your dirtiest thoughts, and still loves you infinitely and wants to do an amazing work in your life and send his son to die on the cross to prove it and to make it possible, right? 
Let's start reading. It says, Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. And the word for searched is when you're searching for treasure. This is the same idea you get in John chapter 1, verse 42, when Peter, who is first brought before Jesus, and it says that Jesus looked at him, but the Greek word for looked is he looked right through him, meaning he looked through his days. He looked at the failures that Peter would make. He looked at the fact that Peter would deny knowing him. He saw everything like in a nanosecond, and he says, right, your name is, right, Cephas, but it's going to be Peter. I'm going to make a rock out of you. I see the mushy parts of you. I see the ugly parts of you. I see the crumbling parts of you. I'm going, I know everything about you, and I'm going to build you up. Lord, you've searched me, and you've known me. You've searched me like one searching for treasure. Maybe some have the view that, you know, oh, don't go to church, right? Because God will be looking for, you know, how many people, how many of you even heard someone say, you know, if I come to your church, the church might burn down. If I come to your church, you better, hey, why don't you come to church? <laughs> do you like your church? Because if I come to your church, it's going to catch on fire, right? What are they basically saying? They're saying that if I come, I'm so foul and so messed up and so wicked that God would have to just literally bring fire judgment down. But see, that comes from a wrong view of God. That's not, the Bible is not introducing us to the God who's looking for a reason to make your life miserable, looking for a reason to just, to just ignore you, looking for a reason to write you off. Maybe humans have done that to you. Maybe your own parent has done that. Your own blood has done that. The Bible's introducing you to the God who's looking for treasure when he looks at your life, looking for treasure, looking for just a little bit of this. Oh, you, you smile this much? I'm going to grow that smile. You, yeah, you're a selfish person, but you have this. When you decide to just share, I'm going to take that and I'm going to expand that. He's looking for treasure when he looks in our life. Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know my downsitting and my uprising. What it means is you know my ups and my downs. What about all the changes of life you go through? You don't even understand your ups and downs. You know, you don't know why you're just so funky, foul, or moody. And someone asks you why, and you know you're funky, foul, and moody, but because you don't have an explanation, you just defend it and deny it. He's the one that knows our downsetting and our uprising. He knows what makes you up. He knows what makes you down. You're telling everyone, no, this thing I'm going through is really not bothering me. Trust me, I've been through worse. But yet you are downcast and you are depressed and you don't even know it, he knows it. Sometimes you walk around thinking you're up and you're really down, but he knows it. And it's not waiting for you to finally say in the prayer closet, you know what, God, it's been 18 years and I realize I've been saying I'm up, but I'm really not up. He already knows our ups and our downs, right? You understand my thoughts are far off. Underline a far off. What a far off means is this. What's the new word today? Trigger, right? Trigger. What happens? Something happens, and it's a stimulus that triggers you to act a certain way, right? Yes? yes. So people say, oh, know your triggers. That's the new thing. They get to know your triggers. But remember this, before there's a trigger, there's a thought, right? Before there's a trigger that leads you to lash out or to snap or whatever it is, before it turns into an action, it turns into a thought. You're triggered to think, I'm being disrespected. You're triggered to think, oh, this person's getting it twisted, <laughs> right? How I many think like, right? That's a lot. A lot of problems begin with that. This person's getting it real twisted about me. You know what I mean? But here's the thing: before that thought, and when that trigger comes, and you say, oh, I, I made a point today, I wasn't going to get triggered. Oh, I thought I didn't have this trigger. Before it even becomes a thought, he already knows. That means how many of you walked into a room and walked out of a room and say, wow. I wish that could be deleted from human history, right? <laughs> that room was better off before I entered the scene. That convo, man, did I make it awkward, <laughs> you know? That, that, it was better before I got there. Before you even walked in the room to even have so-and-so say something that made so-and-so laugh, that made you think a thought, that made you react, and he knows your thoughts way before you even know they're coming. Even before you get triggered, he already knows how you're going to respond, already knows what you're going to do. Now, isn't this relaxing? Because we walk out daily and just get confronted with the fact that we're just a jerk, right? 
Right? End of the day, man, just how many regrets are there often? Man, goodness, you know, could have been nicer here, could have done this better here, could have been more grateful here, right? I mean, to rehearse the day is to, re- here it is. But he knows our thoughts are far off. All of, before you walked out your door, before you even responded to that first text in your bed, he already knows all of your thoughts before you even knew him and did the thing that whatever, whatever. Do you understand now, like, this is what it means to get centered. Now, does, don't you, doesn't this already center you? In a world where you always have to have your guard up and just wonder, well, what do people think of me? What do people think of me? What do they really think of me? What do they really, really think of me? They say they think this of me, but what do they really, really, really think of me? And then you realize, you know what? This doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All that matters is this. In a world where I may never be understood, Jesus wasn't even understood by his own family, right? Until he went to the cross and rose from the dead. Guess what? In a world where I may never be understood, in a world where people may say they get it and not really get it, it doesn't matter. Know why? Because there's one who knows all my thoughts, knows my ups and downs, who gets me. There's one who gets me. How many people just join gangs, societies, religions, all different things, because sororities, fraternities, organizations? Why do we do this? Because we, we want community, but what we really want is we want, just, we want a place of safety. This is the ultimate place. It is in the mind and the heart of God. Lord, you've searched me and you know me. And the beautiful thing is you can search me and know me and still love me. Write that in your notes after verse 1. It's not because really we expect God. We do expect if God is God, we do expect God to know everything. We call that omniscient, right? We say that he's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere. He's omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful, and he's omniscient, he's all-knowing. So we expect God to do this, but here's the mind-blowing thing, that he knows us inside out and still loves us. That's the part that's mind-blowing, right? I don't think anyone is in here today saying, okay, my, my mind is blown, God knows everything. We expect that of God. I mean, even our conscience, our us being made omega dei in his image and likeness, that clicks What's mind-blowing is that he can know everything and still love us. Just picture just the thing that no one knows, the things that no one knows, the thoughts no one knows, the way you think that no one knows. And here's the newsflash. He knows. Okay, I get that. But then here's the newsflash. He still loves you, and it doesn't scare him off at all. He knows all those thoughts way before you even think them. Let's keep reading. You surround my path, verse 3, and my lying down. You surround me. Even when I feel alone and feel like no one's there, you surround me when I'm walking down the street and when I'm lying down, right? And underline this, you're acquainted with all my ways. You're acquainted with all my ways. How many in this room can say that you're acquainted with all your own ways? You're not. Right? That's why we still get surprised and say, wow, how could I have done that? How could I have said that? What you're basically saying is, I still shock myself with the things that I do. He's acquainted with all our ways. He knows all your childhood traumas. He knows everything you've been through. The things that you said didn't really bother you. No, they actually bother you, and it actually still affects the way you view people. It still affects the way you view God. He knows all the things, even the things that you have learned how to explain, and you actually think you're explaining it correctly, he knows every. He's acquainted with all your ways. That was mind-blowing to me when I first gave my life to the Lord at 22 years old and really said, Jesus, I really want to accept you into my heart and I want to walk with you because I was really into, I knew I had problems. <laughs> I knew growing up that I had problems. I remember saying to myself as a teenager, you are messed up. You know what I mean? Keep doing your thing. And you live in a world where others are just as messed up, but you're a messed up person in a messed up world. I got that very early. I wasn't one of them people that had a hard time believing original sin. I wasn't one of those people that had a hard time believing that there was a fall in the Garden of Eden. I wasn't one of those people that down, did not believe there was a devil. I saw all that growing up, right? And it just blew my mind as I started trying to get into new age and meditation and candles and crystals and I was trying to you know just get into and taking mushrooms and shrooming and weed and going on trips you know and almost getting into peyote where you go on real bad trips you know never mind but it was all about I want to figure out what happened to me as a kid 
that makes me do what I do. I want to figure out how bad that was and how much I'm still damaged. I want to really get a report on everything so I could start healing. I didn't know where the healing would come from. I just knew I needed it. What really blew me away when I came to the Lord was first that he would, was willing to forgive me and give me a clean slate with heaven. Two, that he wanted to be my father. And growing up without a father in the home, what that meant, to wow, a father, right? And then three, that he was acquainted with all my ways. There was finally a place I could go and ask, show me, don't just heal me, but show me why I do this. Show me what happened to me that makes me think this way, that makes me do this way. Do I have rejection issues, God? Show me. Where did that come from? Do I have abandonment issues, God? Show me where that came from. Do I have fear of this? Why am I afraid of this? Show me that. This, this, This right here, you're acquainted with all my ways. This is what it means to say, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus, right? This is what it means. This is why people go for walks in the park. What were you doing? I was talking to God, right? It's not just a matter of, well, you know, God, I don't like my job. I want a new job. I really would like an upgrade car. I mean, hey, you, you, you tell them what's ever on your mind. You know what I mean? But this is what it really means to get alone with God. And look, look how we could be walking with God for years and forget this. And what happens? You can know all of this. And what are you doing now? You just want to go to the spa and listen to music the whole time you're there. As though you really, you know what you need. But you're trying to, you've done, tasted, and known the healer, the one who knows everything, and you could be resorting for all of the waters of Babylon instead of his living water. Verse 4, there's not even a word on my tongue, Lord, but you already know it. Before I even speak, you already know what I'm going to say. Before that dumb thing comes out my mouth or even that beautiful thing. I mean, what about, you know, you, you get in a place and you're like, God's not really going to use me. God's not really going to use me. I'm supposed to speak at this men's breakfast. They want to hear my testimony. All of a sudden, I don't even remember. I don't even remember anything. I'm just probably going to call it. And then you go there and man, you get to speaking and man, there's not a dry eye in the place. Well, you didn't know that, but God already knew the words he was going to give you. It says, you know, there's not even a word on my tongue that you already know. Verse 5, you've surrounded me behind me and before me, and you've laid your hand on me. Verse 5, you could basically say, you've got my back. You've surrounded me behind me, you've got my back, and you've got my front. You ever hear anyone say that? Yo, I got your back, I got your front. You've got my back, and you've got my front, right? Well, then that brings the question, too. Well, you know, well, what about if he has my back and he has my front? Well, then why did this happen to me as a kid? Or why did that take place in my life? Now you're getting into the mystery of evil and suffering, right? And here's what we do know. We're not always going to know why certain things were allowed to come into our life. Right? We won't. But we do know this. Isaiah 63 verse 9 says that when you suffer, he suffered with you. People are where was God when I was suffering? Where was God when I was crying and needed him most? Isaiah 63 verse 9, he was weeping. He was suffering when you were suffering with you. We know another thing. Though we may not understand why evil and suffering is allowed into our life, we do know this. If God sent his son to be shredded on a cross to unrecognizable bloody flesh for me, for you, then he's not going to waste any part of your life. You don't pay the price of your only son shredded on a cross to be playing around with even a second of of your life, right? Think about that. How many of you have just paid a lot of money for a car and you're, you, you don't even want the, the wrong, you don't even want Dawn dish soap getting near your car? Why? Because you'll tell someone, as much as I paid for this car, you better put that dish soap inside. We're using only soap that has a turtle on the front, right? Turtle wax, right? And you just, just because you paid so much. Well, what about how much he paid for us to be his? So therefore, though we may not get all the answers of why this, that, and the third happened, we can know and say, even though I don't get it, He gave his son to die for me. He's not going to play with any part of my life. So even if there was a time where it seemed like, man, where was the force field when evil came in? We can still say, God is no liar. You've got my back, God. Not only that, but what does he do? He takes the evil. He takes the lemons and he turns it into lemonade. I look at all the stuff I went through growing up, all the evil, the tough upbringing and whatever in my life. I realize this. Yeah, as a kid, I used to wonder, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? But I tell you what, 
if I didn't have the childhood that I had, I wouldn't have started Level Up. No way in the world. If I didn't have the childhood that I had, the days when it's raining outside, I'd be like, I'm not cooking hamburgers for nobody in the rain. You know what I mean? I'm just sending a text out saying, eat, <laughs> get chips. No. Why? Yeah, it makes you not only do those things, but it makes you do them and not quit. It, God has a way of taking the evil and suffering allowed in your life, and he uses it to make you twice the weapon of heaven towards the, the gates of hell. He actually allows evil into your life. Here's the mystery. But what does it do? It makes you even a greater warrior to go against evil. That's why when you tend to look at a lot of frontliners, a lot of frontliners tend to have a lot of stories. But look, God will switch it up too because he'll take a librarian from Vermont who grew up skiing all their life and then throw them in the front lines too just to show that you can't even figure God out. You know what I mean? So it says this, verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I can't attain unto it. What the psalmist is doing here is he's so blown away that God can know all this about you and still love you that he's saying, this is too much. I, this, it's too amazing for me to even think about. So here's the thing. Ready? Here's the challenge. If you're ever reading this psalm and you get to verse 6 and you don't have, call verse 6 the wow effect. If you don't have the wow effect, it's kind of like the game Shoots and Ladders. You better go back to verse 1, read it again until you get the wow effect. Because when David was thinking about this, he was like, yo, this is too amazing. I'm, I'm messed up right now. That's basically what he was saying. And what he's saying is this. No one knows their own heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says the heart is not only wicked, but the heart is deceitful. It doesn't mean that your heart deceives those around you. Your heart deceives you. He's, God says in Jeremiah 17, verse 10, I alone know the heart. Only one person knows our heart. I'll be at a restaurant. And I remember I used to believe all the same stuff. You ever just be eating and you can't help but hear what someone else says at the table behind you? And you'll be eating and you'll just hear someone say to their friend, follow your heart. And yo, I, I'm like, <laughs> I almost want to say like, yo, I don't mean to be eavesdropping, but like, yo, I've done that. Like, that's bad news, right? <laughs> our hearts are deceitful. But what happens here? We come to the one who knows our heart and loves us, and isn't scared away by the mess. Amen. Mess. Amen. All right, here we go. How would some of y'all describe your heart? Use imagery. Shout it out. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Keep it clean, because you might, you might be like, man, look, I, I, I'm, tempted to, I'm tempted to say something real foul when you want me to describe my heart. But how would you describe your heart? Use one, one word. Selfish. Selfish. All right. Fickle, all right. Huh? Huh? A dirty mess. All right, go ahead. Oh, we can use imagery if you want. We can go deeper than that. Jacked up. Now, now we're starting to get there. <laughs> what else? <laughs> yeah, try. Yeah, some. Yeah, like the trash bins are full and and overflowing and foul and nasty with maggots, right? Yeah, like, oh, you just want to see the nice parts of our heart. Oh, no, see, here's the part of my heart with the memory. Oh, no, you don't want to go in that room, right? You don't want that room, right? What else? Cloudy, pain. Who? Oh, no heart. Heartless, right? If you had to describe it as an object, what would you describe it as? Like, what image comes to your mind when it's just like the heart? What What image? A, f a, fl a flower field where it's just nothing, where all the bees are happy all the time. You know what I mean? And the bees and the squirrels eat side by side and the birds and the squirrels. Is that, is that all that, that's what it is? No. What imagery would you give? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Yo, Victor said K and A. <laughs> For those watching online, look it up. <laughs> He said, it's Kensington and Allegheny in there. See, now we're getting real. All neighborhood. Huh? All neighborhood. The whole neighborhood. What else? What else? I'd say it's a golden pop. To what? To alley cat slap boxing. <laughs> All right, Level Up's chiming in. 
A cactus. Wow. What about you, Michael, you said? Uh -huh. Now, what's inside that golden pot? Because that's what people see. They see the golden pot on the outside. What's on the inside? Potpourri and herbs? I believe it's well-meaning. It has, it has, you know, water and stuff like that, but it's cracked. It's ineffective because of that crack, and that's what prepared by God. I don't believe it's inherently bad. So now this is where i got to correct you. It is inherently bad, right? Look at what's the first thing, the first act in the Bible, Cain killing his brother. And when God says, where's your brother? He says to God, what am I, his babysitter? Is that, is that gold? No. You see what I'm saying? It's a mess in there. But the beautiful thing is this, and this is what Psalm 139 is about. Psalm 139 is not, and here's the good news. Psalm 139, and follow this, y'all, because we're not just here to say, man, what was the sermon about today? Oh, man, it was about just alley cat slap boxing and K&A. <laughs> no, the beautiful thing is this. God not only gets our heart, but when you give your life to Christ, he gives you, by the Holy Spirit, he gives you a new heart. He gives you a heart. Like, for instance, how many of y'all had any heart to even want to care about what God thinks until God touched your heart? How many of you could be absolutely selfish and go home and be like, yeah, whatever, and now it bothers you? How many of you now, when you even get tempted to be selfish, it bothers you? Never mind even doing it. When we come to Christ, the beautiful thing is he not only knows us and gets us, but he gives us this new heart and he makes us more like him. That's why he said, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. God knows where each of us is right now. And here's the good news, y'all. He's not leaving us where we are right now. Charles Spurgeon said this, I'm not what I should be, but I'm not what I used to be. And I'm not what I'm going to be. Do you get that? Then it says this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I go from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed even in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand is going to lead me and your right hand is going to hold me. If I say, surely darkness will cover me, even the night will be light all around me. The darkness hides not from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Basically, it's saying this, God, no matter where I go, you'll never leave me. If I go up to heaven, you're there. Meaning when my thoughts are so heavenly, you just know God is there. How many of y'all, when you're just thinking really good thoughts, you're like, man, God is here. But it says, if I make my bed in hell, what about when your thoughts are just so dark and you're like, God, there's no way God would be around this. It says, I can't even run from you there. What about when it says, if I take a boat and just go to the uttermost parts of the sea? What about when you want to run away from life, people, God, and everything? It says, we still can't run away from God. Now, do you see why in verse 6 he keeps saying, this knowledge is too amazing for me? How many of you guys just journeying through this today, makes you just, it, it just communicates one thing to you, safety. It's safe, Right? You can get so caught up in a web, nothing feels safe anymore, and it's always remembering, wow, that's why the Bible calls God an anchor. That's why it calls him our rock. That's why it calls him our counselor. What did it say of Jesus? It says the Messiah will come, and his name will be called Counselor. Why do you think now the woman who had five husbands and was living a life of being loose with men ran into the village and said, come and meet a man who told me things I've never heard another human tell me is not this God in the flesh. Now do you get it? Now what about as we're journeying through John, when Jesus sees Nicodemus, are you not a teacher in Israel? You don't know these things? Nicodemus comes and says, hey, we know you've come from God. Jesus already knows his next thought. He knows that what he really wants to know is the deeper things. He says, unless a man is born again, he can't get into heaven. As we're journeying through John, what you're seeing is this incarnate. You're seeing the one come down that knows everything. It says, even when I want to be in the dark, verse 12, the dark hides not from you. And again, it's not the one saying, I've proven I'm God again. It's the one saying, don't you get it? I will never let go of you. I will never stop loving you. 
There's not a darkness you can create. There's not a hell that you can run into. There's not a lifestyle of just craziness. There's just a season of just being insane. There's no place you can go that I don't understand and that I will not come find you and rescue you. That's why it says in Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will be really excited about it. So if all this is true, if all this is true, what should we be doing now? If all this is true, what should you be taking to God right now? What is there right now to say, you know? If all this is true, maybe you need to look at your pattern of how you run from God and run from people. Why run from this? I tell you, is this adorable? Does this make you want to adore God or run from God? Let's just be honest. Is there anyone that can read this logically and just say, if this is true, does this make you want to run from God with your problems and the worst parts of you or run to God? So maybe some of us need to say, well, I, man, I, all this is true, but yet here I am trying to do life by myself, even though I'm already a believer. Here I am trying to figure stuff out on my own, even though I'm already a believer. Here I am trying to fast and, you know, starve myself, and fasting has its place, but I'm trying to do all this on my own when all I need to say is, you know what, God? You know. And we should want to get clarity. We should want to understand stuff. But isn't it just so cool to know? I I don't know about y'all, but sometimes aren't you tired of thinking? Don't thinking make you tired sometimes? Don't self-examination just make you tired? So I was like, wait a minute, you ain't even leave the house all day. Why are you so tired? Man, I've just been thinking, man. You're, you're, ah, nothing, but in your mind, you're like, I'm, I'm just thinking. You get tired of thinking. It feels like going to the gym, like pushing a car that ran out of gas. You ever, any of y'all ever push a car that ran out of gas in neutral? Blocks? You should do it sometime. It's real fun. <laughs> but the nice thing about this psalm is, yo, I don't have to always, I don't have to figure it out. He got to figure it out. And there's a comfort in just being able to go to God and saying, you know, here I am. You already know I need you. I don't even know how to put to words what I need, but you already know I need you. I Thank you. And then thank you because you really know that you know that you know. It's not just about, oh, yeah, give it over to Jesus. I know people that never go to church and do whatever, and they know how to say the cliche stuff. I'm talking where you really know. Lord, you know it. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. And then it goes on to say, You've possessed my reins. You covered me in my mom's womb. Look at this. You possess my innermost parts. You covered me in my mom's womb. I will praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You made me. Now it gets even deeper. It goes just from God's omniscience to now his omniscience and even who you are, who you look in the mirror. How many of you, because of society, you've been taught that what you look like in the mirror isn't beautiful? Because of culture, because of race, because of evil, right? And the invention of race. You know in the Bible there's no mention of race? There's no mention of race. There's mention of nations. The whole concept of race was invented for capitalist purposes in oppression and subjugating and world domination and gold and discovery. And it was made to be scientific when it's not. There's nations, but we're all one blood. But how many because of all of this stuff you could just look in the mirror, well, I, well I'm this, I'm, I'm too short, I'm too tall, I'm too this, I'm too wide, I'm too this, my face is this, 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 and that. And then you come to the Bible and it says this, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God made each of us just the way you are. You might not like your nose, but God loves your nose. You may not like your forehead. Take a look at this one right here, bro. They say, I got a five head, not a forehead, a five head. Yo, God made you that way, Right? And what about that comfort? And you know my words, you know my actions, you know why I do what I do, and you made, you made me the way I am. And I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am your work of art. You see, because God accepts us this way, it allows you to accept yourself. Do you know how many people out here are killing themselves slowly, living in crazy living? Because they, they, don't, they don't want to accept who they are. They're trying to be someone else. But what does this teach you? Yo, I can accept myself, how I look, how I act, whatever. He made me this way, and he's not done with me. And the best is yet to come. So it says, 
Verse 15, my substance wasn't hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Lowest parts of the earth means my mother's womb. You saw my substance being unperfect. When I was just this big in the womb and unperfect, you already in your book started writing down my members. You wrote out my skin color. You wrote out what I would look like. You wrote out everything, and you fashioned me when there was no part of me made yet. Now it's getting into the details of when you were in the womb, how when you, no one even knew what you would look like yet, even boy or girl yet. He already wrote everything you would be, wrote your life out, and all of God's his ministry for your life. Now do you see why it says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I have for you. I have thoughts to bless you and not to curse you, to give you an expected end. Verse 17, how precious are your thoughts unto me. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they're more in number than all the sands on the beaches. Lord, your thoughts, and it just doesn't mean your thoughts of love, your thoughts of purpose. How great are they? If you numbered all the sands on the beaches, that is how many his thoughts of love are towards you. Not, not just the church, not just the human race. His thoughts toward me is, are more than all the sands on all the beaches. His thoughts of love towards you. Would you own that right now? You need to really own that. You need to own that. Because what, is, what does this all come down to? Is life hard today or what? Is it challenging? How challenging on a scale of one to 10? A two, right? Jesus said in the last days, these things would happen. How many of you realize, oh, they're happening? I remember there was a time you would share with people that Jesus said in the last days, there'd be earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and race wars, everything. And people, ah, I don't know about that. What, would you read that stuff today? People are like, oh, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? Who are going to be the change makers? Who are in a world where everyone's just kind of tapping out? They're just tapping out and all they want to do is game all day because they're tapping out of life, right? They're just tapping out and just maybe into drugs and alcohol. They're just tapping out. Who are going to be the ones who are going to stand? The ones who know God and the ones who know how loved they are and how understood they are by God. That's going to be the ones. That's what it's about. So, surely... You will slay the wicked, verse 19. Verse 23 and 24, and let's have the worship team come up. This is now what it says. Ready? And this is one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. Would you write in your notes, this is one of the greatest prayers in the whole Bible? This is one of the greatest prayers in the whole Bible. It's like, God, you know everything. You know everything the more I live this life, I don't know. I kind of like the older you get, the more you realize you don't know. But Lord, you know it all. So would you do this? Would you look at this? How many of y'all feel safe right now? How many feel safe? How many understand? Now follow me now. Elbow your neighbor now and say, neighbor, wake up. This is the part you don't want to miss, neighbor. Right? This is the part where everybody wants to walk in. Yeah, this is the part you don't want to miss. Come on back in. All my level up youngins, come back in. Come back in, come back in. Yep, come on in. I'm going to wait for everyone to sit down because this is the part you don't want to miss. And then it's for y'all. Just come on up. See, this is what it means to really be the church and not play church, right? It's like, let's, you, you want this part right here. Y'all could just freeze right there for right now. All right, come on. This is, the, this is the key. What you see through the whole psalm, the first 22 verses, is a declaration. You this, God. You this, God. You're amazing, God. You love me. You're this, God. You're that, God. You're that, God. Verse 23 and 24 is a response now. If all this is true, you guys, and if we feel totally safe, then there should be the right response. Because, right, we can amen this, and you still not really let it sink in that it's safe. How many of you right now have just let God totally x-ray you, and it's okay? Your guard's not up. You're not, you, 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 that urge to explain yourself and get all defensive, it's not there. It's, God's presence is the one place where you don't have to feel that. Well, and I wonder what he thinks of me. Oh, man, I wonder if things will change. This is the one place, the one place you can always go. 
And it's like, Lord, okay, you know my heart. And then all the ugliness in it, you sent Jesus to die for all of it. Because I'll tell y'all, my heart, it's a nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> Freddie is all over it. Except Freddie tries to dress up and look like he's not Freddie, but he's Freddie, right? Jason is there. Michael Myers is there behind doors. If y'all don't know who these people are, good. Chucky, the little, ch it's like a million Chuckies, right? And they're playing all sweet and, 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 and just putting, right? But here's the thing, and it's scary to look at. But because I know, and what about when you first came to the Lord and it was time to really, really pour out everything? But because I know that Jesus died for every ugly thing in this heart, because I know that he got punished and he, like a sponge, absorbed all that punishment and that the only thing left for me is mercy and love, I'm not scared to look at it anymore. I'm not scared. It's not buried in a vault. I could take anything. Are you at a place where you could take anything to God, any struggle to God, and be totally real with God? If you believe this is true, then you're ready for the response. At the end, here's the response. Search me, oh God. Know me. It's like, Lord, now if somebody, if you knew that they were searching you really to blast you, would you ask them for some more of that? Would you say, hey, please, you know, I don't have a second helping of that, you know, smack across the face. I'll have a second helping of hellfire, please. If you knew someone was searching you to punish you, would you invite a search? But if you knew, follow me, y'all, if you knew someone was searching you to find a treasure in you, to grow you, to make you look more like Jesus, to heal you, would you invite more of that? The, 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 the thing that makes you cry and you don't even know why you cry. The thing that makes you depressed, you don't even know why you're depressed. People said you've been depressed since you were little, but you don't know why. If you knew someone was searching you to laugh at that, would you invite another search? But if you knew someone was searching you to heal that, would you invite another search? The psalmist is inviting more. Do you invite more? Because if you don't invite more, you don't know this God of the Bible the way you say you do. You don't really believe what you say you believe. He's inviting him, here, more of that, please. Search me some more. And some of the stuff is ugly to see. But you know what? It's also ugly to go to the doctor and hear that, hey, yeah, there's something, there's a growth in you. Want to see a picture? But it has to come out. You're like, but you're, you're a doctor, thank you. Here's a fruit basket. You know, hey, can I borrow some money? Why? I want to borrow money to buy a fruit basket. Yo, because we know it has to come out and we're grateful. Lord, search me for those things. The things that I feel are, are killing me slowly. The, thing, the ways of thinking that are probably going to end up just taking a toll on my health, the ways of thinking that make me already, uh, my health is already affected by these thoughts. Search me because you're searching me to heal me. You're searching me to make me better. You're searching me so that I can learn that the forgiveness of Christ can go to any place. Look at Jacob. I mean, Jacob, the ultimate hustler of the Old Testament. What did he do? He would use God's name in his lies. His father was like, yeah, you know, who are you? I'm Esau. Well, how'd you? Yo, the Lord, the Lord said this. He would use God's name in his hustle. I mean, most hustlers even know you don't do that. Like, hustle your hustle, but don't use God's name. Not Jacob. He's like, no, I'm, I'm going to tell you the ultimate hustle. What seals the deal is when you use God's name in the middle of it. He did that. And look at what God did with him. If God could forgive a Jacob and make him the father of the whole nation of Israel, then God can do that with anyone. God wants to do everything great in our lives. Search me, O oh God, and know me. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, show me what's in me that's getting in the way. <laughs> show me what's in me. I think the cause of my unhappiness is her. I think the cause of my unhappiness is cousin so-and-so, aunt so-and-so, what uncle so-and-so did to the family. You know, Lord, no. The greatest enemy in my life, you learn after a while, we, we could be our own worst enemy. Lord, show me what's in me that's getting in the way of being a better me. And not only a better me, get in the way of being like Jesus. Amen. So now do you see why Psalm 139 is my favorite psalm? It's that psalm that you just come back and reset the clock to. It's that psalm that you just come bring everything back to. So let's pray. And as we pray, I would just ask, would you just really ask God? Because here's a response. Now it's time to say, you know what? How well do you want to know this God? Is it cool to just say, yo, you know what? That was deep. And then walk off? No. To hear this is to say, you know what? I want a, relation. I want a relationship with him. 
I want a real relationship. If he's real, which he is, and this is true, I want a real relationship with him. And this is where it's time for you to really say, you know what, Lord, I want you in my heart. I want you in my heart. I'm, I've needed you all my life. <laughs> and there's no better time than right now. So let's pray. We're going to also receive today's offering. That's just a time where we give financially or whatever's on your heart. It's between you and God. That's always between you and God. But you can give through the cash app, dollar sign Antioch Philly or online. But hey, everyone, God bless you. Uh, were you blessed today by this? Right? Does it get you excited about the plan God has for you? And that even though you might be the biggest hindrance to the, your next move, God, God is able to do it. And he loves you. And he knew what he was getting into when he, when he hooked himself on to you. That's what it really communicates. Yeah, Lord, I've been walking with you 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Man, I'm crazier. <laughs> right? He knew what he was getting into. Some of you might say, man, if I was God, I wouldn't have picked me. But aren't you glad he's not like you? <laughs> He knew what he was getting into, and he's not done with any of us. Remember, he picked us. We didn't pick him. And if you're here today, he picked you to be here. He drew you here because, you know, we, we, I, we've, we'll, we'll, I'll oversleep off anything. Oversleep. I'll, I'll, I'll be looking at a watch. Watch the battery's dead. I mean, I'll, I'll mess up anything. If I'm here and you're here today, he brought you here today, and he brought you here to love on you yeah. and to let you know, I get it. So let's remind each other of this. Let's let them love on us. And I pray, read this again tonight. If, for those of you who don't have a Bible, you go on your phone, type in Psalm 139, and you read it. If you don't like this version, type in Psalm 139, then type in NIV, New International Version. It's, using, it's not using the thou and the thys. It's just using just straight everyday language, if you will. You know what I mean? But read this. Read it. So, so if you say, yo, pastor, man, you really... You re I've read this a lot. Can you tell? And I had to own it. And I have to re-own it. It's time for you now. Read this. Own it. Just like you own the shoes on your feet, own this. Right? Own it. Just like you say to someone like, yo, no, you can, have, you can eat that food. That's my plate. Right? <laughs> no, no. The food's over there. That's my plate. You owning that. Own this. Make it be your plate. You got me? So, Lord, thank you so much for this gathering today. We love you. Thank you just for reminding us just what it means to just come to safety. You are safety. When nowhere else is safe, you're safety. When no one else gets it, you get it. You love us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you just for being who you are. And frankly, Lord, we would lose our minds without you. And we're going to be honest. We would lose our minds without you. Maybe people wouldn't know, but we would lose our minds over and over and over without you. Thank you for being our sanity and our safety, our healer, the one who gets us, and the one who's got our back in a world like this. Bless us. We need you. Help us. Grow us. Mature us. We want to be like Jesus. Forgive us. And we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, let's worship God, and thank you guys, and God bless